Welcome everyone to today's video. Can you believe how fast time runs? This Apple G4 Cube soon becomes 20 years old. Announced around 2000 by Steve Jobs. A little bit a successor to the next Cube and in some ways a predecessor to the current Trashcan Mac Pro. At the time the Cube was one of the most compact computers. Being in this polycarbonate cube. Like many of my early Macs I got this from eBay. In 2000 I would have no ways to afford this and I got it maybe around 2008 or so used from eBay as usual and this one is quite updated to the maximum. Original it came with a 450 or 500 MHz G4 power PC processor and this one has a processor upgrade card with a 1.2 GHz later revision G4 processor as well as probably maxed out RAM with 1.5 GB and also the fastest possible Radeon graphic card. Initially I got this one with a ATI Rage 128 or so. That card would have been mostly fine. However, PowerPC Linux cannot suspend and resume with the ATI card. It doesn't have register initialization wake-up code for this. This is one of the main reasons why I got a Radeon so that Linux can suspend and resume. To the cube belongs an external power supply. That in my opinion makes the setup slightly less nice. It has a whopping 205 watts. The reason for this is that it has also the double duty of powering the display connected with the Apple display connector. As well as one of those USB keyboards. This may not be the exact original, but this is what I got for the eBay thing. And I got this hated hockey puck mouse. However, I think original it came with some Apple professional mouse thing that I unfortunately do not have, but most of the time I use another mouse anyway. And only original with this transparent plugs, I guess. Externally visible are only the top loading CD-ROM combo drive thing. The cube was fanless, it is relying exclusively on natural convection. And here it's a back. Some product and regulatory information. Many people have issues with hairline cracks here. My unit does not have them. I hope that stays like this. And it has a capacitive touch power button at the top as well. I heard that some people quite ruined their machine putting CDs and such on the ventilation vents here. Uh, you obviously should not place anything on it. All the connectors are at the bottom. I personally find this slightly inconvenient if you have to change cabling and such. So here we got the power supply connector, an old-fashioned analog modem connector, unfortunately. V90 or so, 56 kbit I guess. I actually have the modem in a drawer, never used it though. USB 1, unfortunately. If it would be USB 2, I may use it more often on a daily basis. 2x fire via 400. Ethernet, as well as VGA and Apple Display Connector that has quite some power output pins there that I use with an ADC to a DVI dongle because dongles and that obviously depends what graphic card you install there as I said I switched mine out from a Rage 128 to a Radeon 8500 or something as well as a reset and programmer button not sure what the programmer button does maybe firmware updating something I read that's used for processor update card stuff or so that apparently was a thing in many G5s at the time this kind of programmer button. Probably need to do some more googling on that. Opening it up is as simple as pushing in this handle and then just lifting out the cube like this. And inside here we have the Radeon card that I swapped out. This is by the way some special AGP with this power delivery pins for the Apple display connector as well as the RAM slots. As I said, mine is quite maxed out. I think I have three times 512 megabyte in there. On this side you have the airport card as well as an IDE connector running there. The airport door can be opened here. To get to the IDE drive and such. And because the classic parallel ATA SSDs were rather slow and such and not many to choose from, I later put in here an serial ATA SSD with a adapter board there. So it may be slightly seeable there. Due to space constraints, it's 
not mounted and just hanging in there, not super professionally, but that's what you get with the setup. I was happy when it worked and did not want it to further mess with it. And obviously you can pull out the airport card here. This is a PCM CIA like slot, as I'm not using the airport card that much. I was actually thinking to swap this out to a USB 2 card, but that may only work in Linux and certainly need some driver hacking for that. And the CPU module lives there in the center on this huge heatsink that, as I said in my case, is an aftermarket upgrade from Sonet or something like that with a whopping 1.2 GHz compared to the original 450 or 500 MHz G4. So let's put it back together and also test install T2. This, by the way, looks like this inside. And by the way, this is... Here you see the processor module. So the processor module is this one here on the huge heatsink. And to service the hard drive you need to remove this part of the heatsink. And here you have a second look to the SSD, although it may not be that visible on the camera. As you can see when it's set up on the desk, you cannot really service the cables there. And this is probably also why it gets hair cracks when people lift it up like this and things like this. This is certainly how then the smallest point of failure start to get cracked there. As you can see with the wall brick setup there, it is only a nice setup if you are hiding the cable and power adapter somewhere under your desk or so. As I showed in an earlier video, the mouse is already repaired. Uh, surprisingly, the cable broke here, I guess, because it didn't show up as USB device anymore and uh, soldering a new cable made it work again. So let's power it up. Capacitive touch power button here. And let's see if we get the boot chooser with the Alt key. One problem with these machines is if you are looking to get one, besides that they are obviously getting more expensive, as it's also in the collection of the MoMA of the Museum of Modern Art in New York and things like this. So Apple collector items like this become more and more expensive. And also they often had issues, hairline cracks here, power button issues. Thanks God my machine has none of these issues, although I obviously treat it very carefully. The only issue my machine has is that the CD-ROM is not working nicely, so it's mostly not ejecting CDs nicely. So when I slot in a CD in there, it will most likely not come out by itself as the mechanics and motors are somehow worn out and not really pushing it out anymore. So maybe I need to disassemble the CD-ROM one day. So I usually use pliers to, when it only comes out a millimeter or two, to quickly grab it with pliers and pull it fully out. It's a little cumbersome. And unfortunately, as far as I remember, it may not read CD rewritables. So it may be that I slot this in and it may not even read it anymore. And then I need to pry it out and burn a non-rewritable CD. And also this Macs do not boot from USB, so you can only boot this from internal storage or firewire. Yeah, not sounding that great. Let's see how that goes. It's trying something, but I guess it's CD writing time. So disk removal procedure. As I said, pressing the mouse button to eject, but this eject procedure is better done in an operating system like Linux or Mac OS where you can eject more often than once. Yeah, okay, it's not even coming out a little bit right now, so that will be fun. No, so. it can read it. Maybe I don't need to peel it out then. Interestingly. A little bit slow though. Okay, there it says I.O. error already. Here, let's try to get it out. Maybe burn a CDR, but... Hmm. 
There, so best taken out with pliers, maybe another month or year I try to disassemble the CD-ROM and see if we can improve this again. This is also the point of my videos, not only showing the shiny side, but also problems that you have with vintage machines, so that you learn something. So I go and write a regular CDR of this, and um, don't forget to share, like and subscribe, and I hope to see you soon for the next video trying to test install the latest T2 build on this.